He's our last but not least speaker. This is Manuel Amieva, Professor of Pediatrics, Infectious Diseases, Microbiology and Immunology here at Stanford. Um, I understand he's an avid microscopist, so that's exciting. And I love the title of his talk. It's Gastric Cancer from H. pylori's Perspective. So. <laughs> Somebody has to speak for the bugs. OK, so I'm just going to recap a few things that, that you've heard about the pathophysiology of, of gastric cancer in association with H. pylori, but from the perspective of the bacteria. By the way, as you can see, I'm not a gastroenterologist. I'm a pediatrician, and I worked in infectious diseases and in microbiology, and I'm here at Stanford, so if you guys want to talk to me more, come see me. Um, this is a picture that recapitulates things that about Rick Peak said that I'm going to talk about, and it is that the bacterial location in the tissue is going to turn out to be a really important feature of whether people get sick or not, and also, I think, whether we can clear the infection efficiently or not. So that's the bottom line that I want you guys to take from this, and I'll see if I can convince you of that. But my other goal is that many people that work on H. pylori have never actually seen it in action. So I'm going to show you some movies and stuff so you can see what it actually looks like. Um, so that's what it looks like in scanning EM. It's got flagella on one side, so you guys know it swims. As it swims, it actually wiggles. If we slow down these movies, um, you can see that the body is also wiggling. The reason this is important is because this, this twisting allows the bacteria to actually twirl into the mucus. And also, when it swims, it can just reverse its direction. It can swim like a boat or like a helicopter. And that allows it to actually turn without having to get entangled in the mucus. So now you guys know that H. pylori lives in the mucus. But when I started working on this, I thought, oh, well, H. pylori must love acid because it lives in the stomach. Uh, we did an experiment where we stuck a little needle, and we can make a little gradient of whatever substance we want in the viewing field of the microscope, and we decided to stick acid into a culture of H. pylori to see what it would do. In the left-hand side, you'll see th the needle uh, injecting acid in wild-type H. pylori, and you see that by five seconds, they're already getting out of the way. On the other side of the movie, you see pylori that have been mutated, so they can't smell the the acid, and so they're burning themselves as they get closer. So, and I wanted to show you this because they're exquisitely sensitive to their environment, and this is going to be important in understanding where they are. You are very familiar with biopsies. It's a silver stain, and we know that most of the pylori are going to be in the mucus, and we think that those are free swimming. And then we know that we see pylori attached to the cells, and they come in and attach in cell culture. And when I started, I thought, well, these are like kamikaze warriors. They're coming in to destroy the epithelium. Uh, it turns out that that idea has changed a lot in my mind. A part of the reason I thought they were like kamikaze warriors is because they have these little syringes, needles that they inject, and they cause inflammation, and they also release toxins. Um, but immediately, you know, when, when people started looking at this, they realized that there was more specificity than just coming in and destroying the epithelium. I mean, this is a biopsy that was uh, photographed in 1984, and you see that the pylori are sitting there right in between the cells at the junctions, and this is a 3D reconstruction of the stomach where you can see the bacteria in green, and you can see the bacteria sitting right at the junctions. This is reproducible with polarized cell lines that are not even gastric, and uh, this is also just something for you guys to know that we have here at Stanford. We can do these experiments also with gastric human gastric tissue derived from, um, from biopsies or from pieces of larger pieces of surgical tissue, we can make these little spheroids called organoids. But what we were able to do differently is that when you make spheroids like this, the lumen of what would be the stomach is inside. So that makes it kind of hard. If you want to infect it, you have to stick in a needle. And Keith talked about making this into monolayers. And that's certainly a, a really good technique. We came up with a different idea because we're lazy. Uh, we said, can we, can we manipulate these organoids so we can flip the polarity of these organoids? And we realized that if we remove the signals from the extracellular matrix and put these organoids in suspension or in little slabs of matrigel, they'll actually turn themselves inside out. In the bottom here, you see uh, the bacteria. Oh, I can use this. 
the, uh, sorry, the organoids with the junctions on the outside, whether here the junctions are on the inside. Why this is important is because this allows us to infect them just by throwing the bacteria into the medium rather than injecting them in. I'll show you some examples. But what was also pretty interesting is how they flip themselves inside out. So I'll just show you a little movie. This is one, it's inside the matrigel, the matrix, and this one is outside, and you'll see what happens when it turns itself inside, inside out. It actually literally turns itself inside out. It's not single cells changing the polarity, but rather like a sock, it averts itself. So it's very uh, fast and it doesn't have to rearrange all the proteins. And this is what we can see by confocal microscopy. So the microvilli are inside and now they are outside. Okay, so can we use this? Well, we can, this is a drawing of what you're gonna see, but the bacteria come in and they attach to the junctions. Well, here's a little human organoid. And you can see over here, this bug is already drilling itself in between the junctions. And uh, so it allows us to see these interactions with, with the tissue from the start, right? So way at the beginning of the Korea pathway, this is it. Um, we can stain these and, 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 and document that indeed they are right on top of the epithelial junction. So they're finding something that is very specific at this site. One of my students uh, decided to try and see if she took these organoids, these are producing uh, MUC5AC already, and sticking a needle into the culture media that they are conditioning and compare media that is not conditioned with media that is organoid conditioned, could the H. pylori sense them? Uh, would they be attracted to them? And so we did that asset I was telling you about. On this side, you'll see the organoid conditioned media. I told her this wasn't gonna work because I didn't think there was enough of anything coming out of the organoids, but I was wrong, fortunately, and in about three seconds, you can see that the H. pylori are already smelling the tissue and they are swimming towards it. Um, so, so H. pyloric is not only driven away from the lumen of the stomach by the acid, but it's driven towards you and to, and to the paracellular regions of the cells in order to what? In order to get to you so that it can protect itself from the horrible acid that it has to deal with every day. And that itself is probably the most important reason why it's an inflammatory pathogen. Um, and what we need to understand is what is it doing once it gets there to survive there? And why does it cause disease in some people and not others? Uh, we already heard that the, it starts to inject things like Kage, which have a lot of effects, some direct that are associated with cancer and some indirect that have to do with inflammation. But interestingly, and, 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 and Rick already said this, if we look at these bugs that just attach here, that's where the junctions would be. This is at now a time-lapse movie, so it's sped up. You can see that what these bacteria are doing is they're actually dividing and growing at the junction where they arrived. So you, we're counting them as we wait, you know, about 16 hours, but what were thing one and thing two are now four, then six, then eight. And if we then freeze this movie and look at it by higher resolution microscopy, what we'll see at the end is that we have little clusters of bacteria that are sitting right on top of the epithelial junctions. And what that means is that they're living on your epithelium. They're not just arriving there to destroy it, they're actually using it as a place to live. Now, why that is important is because they're actually modifying the tissue in order to live there. Rick already told you that they extract iron and they use CAGA to actually affect the polarity of the cells. We know that polarity is a really important concept in cancer, but it's also a really important uh, concept in getting rid of microbes. We polarize, we have polarized secretions of mucus, we have polarized secretions of antimicrobial peptides, and the bug is able to alter the ability of the cell to have normal polarized secretions. They make little nests that look like the basolateral side of the cell. Okay, so is all of this fantasy or does it happen in vivo? So that was, that's what, what's been hard to look at because we don't have great models. So the gerbil model is a great model. We decided to make a mouse, a mouse model and we use, were able to use this CAGA injecting strain called Premouse SS1. And when my student Josephine first looked at this, we decided that we wanted to look in three dimensions at the tissue to see where the bacteria really lived. 
So this is a, a, by, by confocal microscopy, a reconstruction of the surface of the stomach. And you can see the bacteria are sitting there. We were very happy to find them. And then you, if you get closer, you can see that they're sitting on top of the junction. So we thought we were done. We found them. But Josephine did something that you know all students should do, which is to look further. So here's now seeing this section from the side. So here's the mucus, where lots of the bacteria are. And you see some bacteria entering the pits. And when she looked deep into this tissue, what she saw is that, oh my god, there are these clusters of bacteria that are actually deep in the antral glands. This is in the antrum of the mouse. And if you look closer, there they are. They're nice spiral bacteria. And we know they're actually growing there because they're dividing. So these microcolonies that we were seeing in tissue culture in the organoids are present in the depths of the glands. And they are organized. They are like concentrated in these regions of the glands. This region of the antroglands in the mouse contains the precursor cells. And again, uh, Rick Peek already talked about how if we stain for mitotic cells, they are right next to, this, to, the, to these clusters. And we can also use markers for cell proliferation, like EDU, and that's where the bacteria prefer to live. In fact, in organoids, they grow better on organoids that are, fr uh, that are immature, that are replicating than in the differentiated organoids. So why, is, why isn't that we have been discussing this in humans for 20 years? Why aren't we just looking at these bacterial population in humans? The reason is that they're hard to see. If you just take a section, usually a biopsy may not even have a full thickness of the, of the tissue because you don't want to make a hole in your patient's stomach. So what we did is we took actually pieces of stomach that, that were sent to us um, by a collaborator by Javier Torres in Mexico where we could orient the tissue really well and make uh, full thickness images of the, of the tissue and use our confocal microscopy. And we actually compared the, 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 what the pathologist could see with what we could see. Uh, I'm not going to show you all that, but I'll just show you that we do see lots of bacteria in the mucus that, as expected. This is the entrance to a pit. And when we uh, look at the surface, we see the bacteria sitting on the junctions. But when we look inside, we actually also see these, these bacterial clusters or microcolonies. And they're sitting in the neck of the glands where we have mitotic cells and we can stain those with markers of proliferation. What we also saw that we didn't expect is if we went even deeper to the base, this is like the submucosa here, we found sometimes bacteria at the bottom of the glands, which is where the stem cells reside. Um, and here's another example with just the junction stain. This is the end of the line here. When we went back into the mouse, uh, like Rick mentioned, these bacteria can sometimes be directly interacting with the stem cells. This is a different kind, this is the LGR5 stem cell. And we went on to show in a mouse model that if we have a mouse that has green stem cells, you get about twice the number of stem cells in about a month or two of infection. So the stem cells are responding to H. pylori. They know that H. pylori is there. Uh, we can quantify that. And they actually know, like, by two weeks, there's already twice the amount of stem cell division uh, that, 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 that uh, even before there's an inflammatory response, we see this response. Okay, uh, we also know that they're activated by lineage tracing, like, uh, like Rick said. So the last thing I'm going to tell you so that you guys can go eat um, is that our goal is really to understand what's going on in this little microenvironment. How do the bugs get there? How do they persist there? And are there tricks that we can use to manipulate them and get them out of there? Perhaps if we get them out of, it, of them even transiently, we can use an antibiotic in two days rather than two weeks. These are our dreams. Um, one thing that we really were searching for is, is there a mutant that cannot colonize the glands but can still colonize the stomach? Why do they need to go there is the question, if they can just live in the mucus. This, bug, this stomach has uh, these bugs in the glands and in the mucus, this is a wild type bacteria. We actually found a mutant that doesn't get into the glands but can live in the mucus and it colonizes the mice to the same numbers. So why? And what is the consequence to the host? Well, with this mutant, we've been able to do a few things. 
if we look at the, the colonization, the same, but when we look at the activation of the stem cells, it's like the animals are uninfected. And if we look at pathology over a period of six months, these glands get very hyperplastic and inflamed with H. pylori, but with the mutant, they almost look like uninfected. So uh, why would the microbe want to do that? Well, that's a pretty long story that I'm not going to tell you right now because you need to eat. But here's one experiment. If we give them a single infection, these bacteria are both able to colonize at the same level. What if we mix H. pylori that is wild type with the ones that can't get into the glands and we give it to a mouse? Who's going to win or are they going to be the same? And the answer it was very, very clear. The mutant cannot colonize, cannot persist in the stomach once if the wild type is there. And if you want me to explain why that is, I can, but I'm not going to do so right now. The last thing I'm going to tell you is that these processes uh, are, are having to do with environmental sensing. The bacteria can change their behavior depending on the nutrients that are around, like the iron. They can decide when to inject kage the depending of whether they can sense and swim towards and away from things, so that's called chemotaxis. The protein I told you that was mutated in that bacteria that can't get into the glands has to do with chemotactic sensing. So we've been trying to understand what is it that drives them into these places. So one thing, one manipulation we can do, which I'm going to leave you with, is we can control acid in the stomach. You guys do it all the time. Pylori is ultra sensitive. Here's a difference in, this, in these needles, is a difference of only uh, about 100 nanomolar in hydrogen ions. And in this pH of 7.1, they're swimming towards the needle. In this pH of 6.5, they're swimming away from the needle. So there, it's not like it has to be acidic at three. They just can sense very, very minor changes. So in our mice model, most of the bacteria are in the antrum. There's a few as you get into the corpus, but, but they don't like being in the corpus, which is the most common finding in humans as well. Um, if we look at the corpus here, you see these big parietal cells. The bacteria are in the antrum, but not really in the corpus. So what if we go to CVS and we prescribe some omeprazole to these to these mice. Well, within two weeks, the bacteria migrate into the corpus, and now they can live in the glands of the corpus. So this is important because in a bad way, you know, now we're starting a stimulus of inflammation and persistent infection of a part of the body that the bacteria didn't really need to go in. Um, and perhaps this is the beginning of a pangastritis for this animal. Um, this is the quantification. So I'm just going to end there because we're all hungry, but uh, I want to thank a lot of our collaborators and my students that have been able to do this work. And I'm here, so if you want details, just come over and we can chat for three hours. <laughs>